In his final days, Alexander the Great's generals asked him who should succeed him. Alexander's answer, the strongest. Taken literally, this would see the close of the classical Greek age, an age thousands of years in the making. Join me, Mark Selleck, as I go back to retell the story of ancient Greece in my series Casting Through Ancient Greece. We will cast our way back to its beginnings, all the way through to the spread of its culture throughout the known world, thanks to Alexander and his generals. You can listen or subscribe to the series at www.castingthroughancientgreece.com or you can listen on your favourite podcasting platform. Don't forget to follow the series over on Twitter at Casting Greece or on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece. I look forward to seeing you there. In 1704, a 16-year-old adolescent by the name of Nadar Koli, alongside a handful of other young men, stood in the dusty training grounds of the local militia situated at the city of Dargaz, located within the wider mountainous region of Khorasan, marking the northeastern borderlands of the Safavid Iranian Empire. A newly enlisted soldier of the local governor he had been selected to join with the Tofangchi, the infantry musketeer arm of this ragtag regional force. And for the first time ever in his short and poverty-stricken life, had just been handed an old matchlock musket by the elderly and irritated sergeant who was working with these raw recruits. And while Nader had seen such weapons in the past, it had been an uncommon enough occurrence in his part of the world being much more familiar with cavalry and the traditional weaponry of his tribal people, the likes of composite bows, lances, javelins, swords, axes, and maces. These people that had long frowned upon the use of these small arm gunpowder weapons in battle, viewing them as unwieldy, cumbersome, and some would say even dishonorable. However, as Nader held the 10 pound firearm he began trembling ever so slightly with an electric mix of nervousness and excitement while taking out a paper cartridge filled with gunpowder and a lead musket ball, and as he'd been instructed, ripping it open with his teeth before carefully pouring it down the barrel and packing everything down with the ramrod alongside the other recruits that had finally managed to get their muskets loaded to the impatient exasperation of the elderly sergeant who, in between yelling out obscenities at the young men, was roaring at them to move faster, before all together taking aim at their adversary, a straw-stuffed target wearing rags in order to resemble a human foe that had been set up 50 meters away. Nader squinted to narrow his field of vision and bring the target into focus, his penetrating glare unfazed by the distractions around him completely focused on the task at hand, a reverie only broken by the sergeant's barking command to fire, followed by flashes of light from the old muskets and a series of loud popping sounds reverberating through the air, and despite most of the group missing the target ahead, of the few that had struck it, they had still managed to chop their straw-filled human-shaped target down to the ground this moment leaving a definitive impression on the young Nader, who immediately came to understand the power and ruinous impact that such weapons could have on anything that stood in his way. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. The focus of this podcast is on people those defined by the term warlord. Fascinating warriors and leaders that made a huge impact in history, some with more lasting effects and others that were relatively short-lived, but certainly no less interesting. That said, when I select a particular warlord, I plan to, of course, review their lifetime and actions, but also take this further by looking at the environmental and political conditions right before their lifetime, we'll explore their motivations for taking on the mantle of war. We'll cover what they did, how they did it, and finally, what their legacy was beyond their demise. 
but with the caveat that I'm going to go beyond the mainstream historical figures that everyone knows about by taking on lesser known subjects, such as the feature of this episode, Nader Shah, a relatively obscure figure by Western standards that was most certainly a brilliant battlefield commander, having since been dubbed by historians as the Napoleon of Persia and the second Alexander, rightly positioning Nader Shah among some of the greatest military commanders that the world has ever seen, who, in a terrifyingly quick and brutal fashion, reversed the fortunes of Iran in the early 18th century, regularly defying steep odds to save it from a particularly chaotic period before usurping the crown and taking control of the empire for himself, reigning as the king or Shah of Iran from 1736 to 1747. Now, before we get into this, just a little housekeeping to get to first, because I have the deep honor of welcoming Lubos F. Davidas M., with a mention also going out to Daniel R. as the first inductees into the ranks of the Warlords of History Immortals. Thank you for supporting my efforts and for helping to cover the costs associated with making this podcast happen. With gratitude also going to all my listeners and those that have taken the time to reach out with such encouraging comments. I can't express enough how motivating all of this is. And in the event that you too are interested in supporting my work directly through Patreon, I'll include the link in the show notes, which can also be accessed through the support page on the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com. Of course, no pressure at all to do so, but it would definitely be appreciated. All right, let's get to it. In full transparency here, Nader Shah was a pretty obscure historical figure to me that I knew little about, and the primary reason that we are now embarking on a series on him comes as a result of many of your suggestions and comments, especially in the wake of the inaugural series that kicked off this podcast, covering Amir Timur, also known as Tamerlane. And I am glad that you did, so thank you for that. Because while digging into the research and unpacking Nader's story, frankly, I've been astounded by what I've learned so far, certainly feeling that it deserves to be brought to light, at its foundation, it being the unlikely story of a self-made man emerging out of abject poverty, who, despite operating in a deeply unstable and chaotic environment, used cunning, intelligent diplomatic positioning alongside the adoption of technology and sheer brutality to win incredible battlefield victories, often heavily outnumbered versus the adversaries that stood in his way, ultimately allowing him to rise as the Shah of Iran, a position typically reserved only for those possessing divine right, meaning a claim to rulership effectively ordained or mandated by God thereby legitimizing the political authority of a monarch and the subservience of the wider populace. This being one of the ways that Nader Shah broke with the mold of tradition. One of a number of key respects, others including religion and the nature of warfare itself, with the advent of advanced gunpowder technologies, weapons and tactics. All of these forces coalescing and being uniquely manipulated by Nader through which he took hold of a deeply splintered and crumbling Safavid Iranian empire to transform it into a feared and rather unstoppable militaristic state, reinventing it as the Afsharid Iranian empire, then violently lashing out at all the adjoining foreign states that surrounded Iran and that had long been eating away at its borders, such as the mammoth Ottoman Empire to the west, the surging Imperial Russian Empire in the northwest, the Uzbek Khanat states to the northeast, and the decadent Mughal Empire in the east, along with campaigns in the Persian Gulf to the south. So, at this point, you may be asking, if all of this is true, why haven't I heard of Nader Shah before? 
How does one gain unofficial titles like the Second Alexander and the Napoleon of Persia, yet still remain buried in the folds of history? Well, the latter descriptor. The Napoleon of Persia maybe gives us a good hint as to why. Because Nader was born and ruled just before Napoleon Bonaparte came into existence. Napoleon being born in 1769, two short decades after Nader Shah's death in 1747. And consequently, despite Nader's military brilliance and daring conquests, he has been largely overshadowed from a historical context by this near contemporary. When thinking about this, a more accurate descriptor should probably be that Napoleon is the European Nader Shah, which, interestingly, is a notion that is gaining some traction in the Middle East. And in fact, there may be some actual truth to this, since according to some historians, Napoleon indeed admired and may have been influenced by Nader's exploits. Having read about him during his youth and perhaps identifying with his story, a kindred spirit of humble origins who would rise to heights typically reserved for God-ordained kings and then proceed to shake the world, evidenced by a letter that Napoleon wrote to a later Iranian ruler in 1807, in which he praised Nader as a great warrior who was able to conquer a great power, who struck insurgents with terror and was fearsome to his neighbors, and that triumphed over his enemies and reigned gloriously. However, underneath Napoleon's glowing assessment of Nader Shah's abilities and achievements, are the realities of an individual with complex character traits. Influenced by his harsh environment and experiences, some traits to be admired and some less so. For example, his motivations for grasping power. Some historians equating this with the actions of a heroic individual or even that of a savior driven by nationalistic pride. And while there is some credibility to this notion, since Iran could have very well been ripped apart at the seams by internal factions and the surrounding foreign powers had Nader not arrived on the scene, other historians argue for less noble motivations, indicated by the following, that while during his early career he may have been driven by noble convictions, protecting the populace and his homeland against raiders and insurrections, it may have been that he was simply an opportunist positioning and aligning himself with others that would allow him to climb the veritable ladder. As a person whose defining characteristic was an unquenchable thirst for personal power, partially driven in the attempt to control his environment, rather than be swept up in the violent world that he had been subjected to during his early adolescence. Also citing that although Nader came from poverty, he was not necessarily sympathetic to the plights of the downtrodden and wider populace during his reign, his rule becoming increasingly despotic and harsh as it progressed, including ceaseless military campaigning that resulted in a huge loss of life, both among his enemies and his people as well, while also heavily and oppressively taxing the populace and eventually ruining the Iranian economy to fund his ever-expanding and formidable army. In short, Nader, as a lover of war, viewing this as his path towards more personal power, with Nader himself throughout his career emphasizing this, often referring to himself as the son of the sword. A notion that is perhaps best encapsulated to us by Lawrence Lockhart in his 1938 book on Nader Shah, wherein he refers to an anecdote with Nader and a holy man that were engaged in a conversation about paradise. The Islamic cleric proceeding to describe the lavish pleasures that awaited him in heaven. And when he was done, Nader reportedly asking, Are there such things as war and victory over the enemy in paradise? When the holy man answered no, Nader then replied, How can there be any pleasure then? And it was as if he was destined for a life of military campaigning. Described by almost all sources as an excellent soldier with a commanding presence. Physically imposing. Over six feet tall, towering over most of the men around him. Also possessing a hardy frame and a stark, 
jet black full beard with a loud projecting voice. But most importantly, possessing a natural talent for steadfast leadership and tactical brilliance that people rallied behind, including his revolutionization of the Iranian army, that he would lead to a devastating effect, soundly defeating all that stood before him, thus earning him the additional moniker as the last of the great Asiatic military conquerors, in the spirit of Amir Timur and Genghis Khan before him and all the other aforementioned unofficial titles that he has since gained, though certainly none more important than the Shah of Iran, later adopting the title Shah and Shah, meaning King of Kings, a position gained that is all the more impressive considering his starting point. Being born into a family of no significant lineage or status, a peasant family of humble origins, that could have been any one of the hundreds of thousands or millions that lived in Iran at that time that we'll never learn the names of. His birth taking place in 1688 in a small fortified compound near modern Dargaz, today a city on the northeastern edge of Iran that was previously called Abavard at the time. Located within the mountain-saturated region known as Khorasan, the northeastern territories of the Safavid Iranian Empire. The name Safavid corresponding with the dynasty that ruled over these lands at the time Nadar was brought into the world. Khorasan was home to a number of various tribal groups, many of whom were of Turkic origin that had been settled there, including the Afshar, the tribe to which Nadar belonged. And while the Afshar had originally migrated and settled in the lands around modern Azerbaijan and northwestern Iran due to the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, some segments of this group, like that of Nader's ancestors, were subsequently resettled in Khorasan in the late 1500s, early 1600s by earlier Safavid kings to populate and develop the area, while also serving a dual purpose in helping to fight off the Uzbek states and raiders that perpetually threatened northeastern Iran. The lands around the city of Dargaz represented the winter grazing grounds for the Afshar, who for the most part lived a semi-nomadic or pastoralist type of lifestyle, like that of Nader's parents, his father being Imam Kuli, a simple shepherd who followed a yearly migration, driving their small flock of sheep from the low-lying pastures around Dargaz, traveling about 40 kilometers southwest, up to the highlands of the Kopet Dag Mountains, and an area called Kapkan, where the summer grazing lands lay. But as would have been the case for many other families in the area, always precariously close to the edge of poverty, requiring Imam Koli to also work as a coat or hat maker, in order to make ends meet and bring in the additional income to keep his family fed. This was the regular flow and tide of life for these people like that of Nader's parents. However, in 1688, Imam Koli and his wife's typical travels back and forth were slightly disrupted, remaining longer near Dargaz than would have been normal, behind the protective walls of a small fortified outpost. Though far from being an inconvenience, this was a welcome disruption, since it was due to the impending arrival of their first son, that they named Nader Koli, the future Nader Shah. And while the small walled compound wouldn't have been much to look at, it did provide at least some measure of security for the young family. Also, long serving as one of several safe havens for the Afshar in that area a refuge for Nader's people against the border raids reaching deeper and deeper into Khorasan. Not exclusively, but mainly at the hands of Uzbek raiders that had intensified in the region towards the late 1600s. The Uzbeks being another ethnic Turkic tribal people that by the time of Nader's birth had come to settle and dominate Central Asia, just to the northeast of Khorasan. Forming two different states, the Khanat of Bukhara and the Khanat of Kiva. You see, Khorasan had long been an embattled region of Iran, 
the Safavids and Uzbeks fighting for dominance there for nearly 200 years. And while earlier Safavid rulers, such as Shah Abbas I, also known as Abbas the Great, had managed to stabilize and firmly take control of the region by the early 1600s, a subsequent series of lethargic Safavid rulers, especially from around 1666 onwards, more interested in languishing in their ostentatious harems than ruling over their empire, led to the Safavids doing a frightfully poor job of asserting authority in Khorasan, while also neglecting the sharpness of their military, allowing the Uzbeks to reignite their claims over Khorasan, resulting in expanding their presence there at the expense of the Safavids, through ever-intensifying raids and incursions that continually chipped away at the northeastern Iranian frontier. A situation made more complex by the various tribes that Safavid monarchs had settled there, along with the Afshar, this including other Turkmen tribes, Kurds and native Persians, resulting in a patchwork of people residing there, a powder keg of different peoples with conflicting ambitions. To say that Khorasan was experiencing a challenging period in the late 17th century would have been a massive understatement. A better characterization being that Khorasan was deeply unstable and seeing brutal flare-ups of violence. And it was about to get worse, much worse, descending into utter chaos. Which goes way beyond the symbolic and was in fact endemic of a wider crisis of instability facing the whole of Safavid Iran, largely thanks to those lethargic and inwards-looking Safavid kings that we touched upon earlier, whose power was beginning to cascade into rapid decline, not yet teetering on collapse, but quickly heading in that direction. But in order to more clearly understand how this came to be, and the tumultuous environment into which Nader was born, including the political, religious, economic, and technological overtones that were melding into one another, impacting his world, we're going to backtrack in time, connecting this story to the figure that kicked off the very start of this podcast, and the series on Amir Timur, also known as Tamerlane, and the events that occurred shortly after his death in 1405, with the decline of his vast Timurid empire. But before we get into that, let's start with a naming convention. Iran or Persia, which is the correct one for Nader's nation? From a modern perspective, Iran is the country in Western Asia, today officially called the Islamic Republic of Iran. However, both Iran and Persia are often used interchangeably in historical and cultural contexts to describe the area, which is what I'll also be doing throughout this series. The name Iran, in fact, derives from a 3rd century Sasanian term found on an inscription used to describe the people that inhabited Persia, initially called Aryan, which eventually evolved to acquire more of a geographical connotation lands that have been home to a number of the world's oldest and most powerful civilizations. Civilizations that rose and fell, often assailed by the next in line, beginning with the Elamite kingdoms in the 4th millennium BCE, later unified by the Medes in the 7th century BCE, then reaching its territorial height in the 6th century BCE as the centerpiece of the Achaemenid Empire that has often been described as the world's first superpower. Before succumbing to the conquests of Alexander the Great, that eventually paved the way for the rise of the Parthian Empire and the reunification of Iran in the 3rd century BCE. Later, succeeded in the 3rd century AD, or Common Era, by the Sasanian Empire, which became a major world power for the next four centuries. This until the 7th century, when the Muslim conquest of Persia occurred, also referred to as the Arab conquest of Iran, which led to the collapse of the Sassanids and the Islamization of Iran. Islam, mostly of a Sunni persuasion, replacing Zoroastrianism as the dominant religion. With Islam firmly taking root in this part of the world, 
managing to survive in Persia despite the Mongols conquering the region in the mid-1200s, forming the Ilkhanate. But that soon fractured into what was effectively a series of smaller fiefdoms, until Emir Timur blazed onto the scene, who, as a quick side note, it has been argued that Nader was quite the admirer of. And while this is a contested notion, I find this quite probable, as stories of Timur's rise and reign would have undoubtedly been part of the oral tradition of the area. And Nader placed immense value in his Turkoman ethnic heritage. And although there was no direct ancestral linkage between the two, this was nonetheless a heritage that he shared with Timur. Beyond this, however, there were a number of interesting parallels between the two that may have resonated with Nader. As self-made men who, despite the odds being stacked against them, both followed an unlikely path to power, forging empires through conquest, both as brilliant battlefield commanders. Timur, as you may recall from the first five episodes of the show, emerged out of Transoxiana in Central Asia and among his many conquests, aggressively swept into Iran, conquering and absorbing the entirety of what was then called Ilkhanat Persia, through a series of rapacious campaigns during his reign, establishing the Timurid Empire, that quickly fell apart in the second half of the 15th century in the aftermath of his death, largely due to having failed to insert a capable successor to his empire, that had been forged in blood and fire. And by the late 1400s, the divided and war-torn Timurid Empire had lost control over much of its territories. Iran in particular, left politically splintered, caused in part by Timur's successors that habitually partitioned what remained of his empire, which ultimately allowed these smaller pieces to fall in the hands of tribal warlords. This creating a power vacuum, and the perfect opportunity for one, provided that they could obtain enough military support to rise and consolidate power in. Thus bringing us much closer to the timeline surrounding Nader's lifetime and the founding of the Safavid Iranian Empire that Nader was born under. The Safavid dynasty and empire founded by Shah Ismail I in 1501, who emerged out of Iranian Azerbaijan a historical region that today marks the northwestern limits of modern Iran, and that managed to attract a sizable following of tribal peoples in the region, primarily due to one distinguishing feature of his heritage, this being the adherence to Shia Islam, in contrast to Sunni Islam, that largely dominated Persia at the time. However, Ismail's appeal to the tribes around him, including that of Nader's Afshar ancestors, that also followed Shia Islam, went far beyond adherence. Because the Safavids claimed authority and legitimacy to rule over others based on their lineage, drawing a direct family linkage as the male descendants of Ali, the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. Ali, regarded by the Shia as Muhammad's successor and the first Imam, thereby the divinely appointed authority on all matters of faith and law regarding Muslim doctrine. And while we'll spend more time unpacking the importance of religion in later episodes, since it plays such a fundamental and fascinating part of the story, the takeaway here for now is that Safavid authority to rule was granted through Shia Islam, and therefore the source of their divine right. With the Safavid Iranian Empire being a theocracy, religious and political power completely intertwined, encapsulated in its monarchs. And, as mentioned, the mechanism used by Shah Ismail I to secure and collect the support of the various militant tribes that inhabited Iranian Azerbaijan, who followed under his banner to establish his capital in the city of Tabriz, and then proceeded from there to conquer much of politically splintered Iran in a rather quick sequence, in less than 10 years, while also kicking off the long-standing Safavid policy of forcibly converting the predominantly Sunni populace to Shia Islam. In fact, a particular branch called Twelver Shiaism, thereby forming Iran into a predominantly Shia nation, 
amongst a surrounding sea of Sunni-based nations, a configuration that persists to this day, marking one of the biggest legacy items that modern Iran has gained from the Safavids. So who exactly were these militant Shia tribal warriors that formed the backbone of the early Safavid army? Collectively, they became known as the Kizilbash. Kizilbash meaning redheads in the Turkmen language owing to the distinctive crimson headwear that they wore in battle, a name originally bestowed upon them as a pejorative label given to them by their Sunni Ottoman adversaries, but was later adopted as a source of pride. And while this group provided the military force through which the Safavids were able to assume power and ultimately control of Iran, although this lessened over time, they remained an important part of the military throughout the Safavid dynasty, into Nadir's reign as well. The tribes that formed the basis of the Kizilbash, like that of Ismail I, originated out of Iranian Azerbaijan and its adjacent territories, including Eastern Anatolia, Armenia, and the Caucasus. And even before uniting under Ismail, were regularly involved in altercations with the mighty Ottoman Empire, usually in a raiding-type capacity, while often fighting amongst themselves for dominance in the region. Also, largely due to their pastoralist type of lifestyle, developing a long-standing and proud cavalry tradition, coinciding with that of the armies of the early Safavid rulers, holding an almost exclusive reliance on cavalry, Mounted troops armed with weapons including composite bows, spears or lances, swords such as the Shamshir or Persian scimitar, and other melee weapons including maces and battle axes. With the notable absence of any gunpowder firearms, unwilling to adopt this new technology, viewing the early versions of these unwieldy weapons best utilized by infantry as not only completely at odds with their style of combat, but also dishonorable, while still providing the Safavids with an exceptionally effective military arm, offering dynamic mobility and quick maneuvering in battles, engaging in tactics such as ambushes, feigned retreats, and devastating shock charges on any infantry encountered. And it was these foundational features of Safavid Iran, Shia Islam and the Kizilbash, that also highlight for us two key differences versus the nation that would become its arch-rival throughout this period. The Sunni Islam-based and terrifyingly powerful gunpowder empire that bordered Iran almost entirely along its western flank, the Ottomans. The two differences doing much to almost immediately sour the diplomatic relationship between these nations. That right from the onset, and throughout the history of Safavid Iran, saw them regularly involved in ideological and territorial disputes with the Ottomans. And more often than not, with the Safavids seeing the losing end of the engagements. Also, rendering harsh lessons on the dire importance of gunpowder weaponry and units, none more poignant than the one incurred at the Battle of Calderian that occurred in the plains of western Iranian Azerbaijan in 1514, during which the Ottomans deployed heavy artillery, cannons and mortars, and thousands of their elite slave infantry, the Janissaries, equipped with muskets situated behind a barrier of carts to soundly defeat the Safavid forces and decimate their cavalry charges. With a word like massacre being a more accurate descriptor of the encounter, Impressing upon Ismail and successive Iranian kings the importance of incorporating gunpowder weapons, artillery and firearms into their forces rather than a sole reliance on traditional cavalry. But whereas the Ottomans had long adopted these newer weapons, since the 14th century in fact, innovating in this area and ever increasing and perfecting their use in battle, which was a key contributor allowing the Ottomans to grow into the mighty empire it had become. The Safavid adoption rate was comparatively much slower due to the heavy influence of the Kizilbash that occupied the bulk of the important military posts and administrative offices throughout Iran. 
However, the slow Safavid adoption rate later turned to acceleration during the reign of Abbas I, also known as Abbas the Great, who in the late 1500s, early 1600s, upended the Safavid military, spending greatly to more aggressively incorporate gunpowder weapons into its army, modeling this new contingent of their army on the Ottoman Janissaries, creating a new class of Iranian soldiers called Gilman, or Gulams, meaning slave soldiers. These being, for the most part, non-Muslims from the Caucasus, ethnic Georgians and Armenians that were enslaved, through conquest and purchased by the crown, converted to Shia Islam, and pressed into military service, but also paid, despite being slaves so that they were loyal to the Shah and the Shah alone. Under Abbas the Great, this force becoming the core of the royal army, adding up to about 40,000 troops in total. That included mounted units armed with muskets, musketeer infantry, and artillery, standing in contrast to the estimated 40 to 60,000 Kizilbash that he also had under his charge. And with this policy in particular, changing the political landscape of Safavid Iran in the following ways. By breaking the stranglehold that the Kizilbash had over the military and reducing their political influence, which had become rather unruly, sometimes even playing kingmaker to whoever sat on the Iranian throne. This policy also centralizing the authority of Safavid monarchs and their rule over Iran, and of course the more obvious benefit of modernizing its army, made into a more formidable force. This point, marking the apex of Safavid Iran's political, cultural, and economic power, and through which the empire was expanded and made more secure, facilitating upswings in trade, at its height, including among its domains, all of what is now Iran, the Azerbaijan Republic, Armenia, and Eastern Georgia, along with parts of the North Caucasus, Iraq, Central Asia, and the Western portions of Afghanistan and Pakistan. In case you're interested, I have a map on my website that will help put all of this into perspective so you can see what I'm talking about here. With a couple of key side notes, including that Abbas the Great also moved the capital of the empire from Tabriz to Isfahan, presiding over elaborate and lavish building projects and situating it further away from the reach of the Ottomans, while also breaking up the tribes that supplied the ranks of the Kizilbash, like that of Nader's people, the Afshar, transplanting them to the fringes of the empire, thereby further reducing their authority while still being of use to help defend the borderlands. Together, the Ottomans, Safavids, along with the nation that bordered Iran to the east, the economic powerhouse that was the Mughal Empire, make up what has been coined as the Gunpowder Empires by the historians Hodgson and McNeil. A phrase that holds some truth, but is a bit misleading. Because while the Ottomans and Mughals had fully embraced gunpowder early on, innovating with this technology, and steadily increasing the number of gunpowder units in their respective arsenals. Although Abbas the Great certainly began this transition for the Safavids, his successors failed to improve upon the fearsome military machine he had built. And as Michael Axworthy points out in his book, Sword of Persia, Nader Shah, From Tribal Warrior to Conquering Tyrant, the majority of the Safavid military, even at the point of Abbas's reign, mostly used swords, lances, and bows well into the mid-18th century. It was not until the rule of Nader Shah's Afsharid dynasty that the majority of Iran's troops would be equipped with firearms for the first time. And beyond failing to continue with the modernization of the Safavid army, this began to turn to outright neglect from the mid-1600s onwards. Firearm-based units not expanded, equipment not updated and falling into disrepair, with the artillery corps almost entirely fading out of existence after Abbas the Great's reign. Certainly an ill omen for things to come. But perhaps even worse than that was that the overall discipline of their forces began to horribly degrade as well. This was indeed a dark time for Safavid Iran. 
because while the empire had always been the quote-unquote lesser of the three gunpowder empires, possessing the overall smallest military and by far the least population and economic might when compared to the Ottomans and Mughals. For example, to help shed some light on these disparities, the population estimates for these respective empires at the year 1700 are as follows. The Mughals, with a whopping population of almost 160 million, 23% of the global population. The Ottomans with about 25 million, whereas Iran contained about 10 million souls. While looking comparatively at their economies in 1700, the gross domestic product estimates, roughly equated to modern US dollar value, have the Mughal Empire generating 91 billion per year, the Ottoman Empire making about 62 billion annually, and of course at the back of the pack, Safavid Iran, generating what I would consider to be a generous estimate of no more than 15 billion per year. And yet, despite these considerable differences, for much of the tenure of the Safavids, they had still managed to keep Iran roughly on par with the Ottomans and Mughals in their projection of wealth, power, and cultural prestige. However, by the late 1600s, this divide was widened considerably with Iran falling further and further behind, with all the surrounding nations, and not just the Ottomans and Mughals, taking notice and increasingly taking liberties given the weakened state of Safavid Iran. Which brings us to the question, how was this allowed to happen? Well, it's largely as a consequence of a series of ineffectual Safavid kings from the mid-1600s onwards. Within the backdrop of a toxic court culture that had developed, one of intrigue, plotting, and counterplotting among the Shah and their surrounding courts, dangerous internal politics, often involving extensive and bloody purges when new Shahs assumed the throne or when conspiracies were uncovered, whether real or imagined. So much intrigue and suspicion that even prince successors to the reigning Shah were considered a threat increasingly left in the care of the women and eunuchs of the harem, and therefore not appropriately groomed, educated, and trained for rulership. The last of the Safavid shahs taking less and less interest in local and foreign affairs, instead retreating to the interior life of the palace, where in addition to the copious intrigues, there were other distractions available aplenty, like sex, opium, and liquor. All of this and their complete inward focus, creating not only a severe disconnect to the realities of the outside world, but also dangerously eroding the authority of the Shahs, whose power was being gobbled up by subordinates. Whereas earlier Safavid monarchs had managed to build an effective administrative bureaucracy, filling these positions based on merit and answering to the Shah and the Shah alone, this began breaking apart as seen during the reign of Shah Suleiman I, who ruled from 1666 to 1694, and is noted for having left the vast majority of his political decision-making in the hands of prominent clerics, court administrators, and harem eunuchs, whose power increased significantly during his reign, coinciding with a huge uptick of corruption throughout Persia, straining the economy, while at the same time placing heavier burdens on the populace through the imposition of new and higher taxes, which in turn sparked widespread poverty, anger, and rebellions, a situation that not only greatly disrupted merchant activity and trade, but that were also adding fuel to the perfect storm that was gathering on the horizon, pushing the Safavid Iranian Empire to collapse made worse by an ill-equipped and ill-disciplined royal army that was increasingly unable to assert law and order within its domains, resulting in native tribal warlords popping up throughout Iran, including those of the Kizilbash that were situated at the fringes of the empire. And finally, foreign incursions that were compounding the chaos taking hold of Iran, looking to take a piece of it for themselves. Notably, their arch-rivals, the Ottomans, who earlier had conquered a huge proportion of the western Safavid domains, 
Mesopotamia, and the Western Caucasus. The surging kingdom that would become the Russian imperial empire of Peter the Great, that had overtaken the lands in the Caucasus near northwestern Persia, traditionally under Safavid authority. The Mughals that had expanded into eastern Iran, modern Afghanistan. And finally, the Uzbek Khanats, that had not only conquered large swaths of northeastern Iran, but were now raiding deeper into Khorasan, where Nader's family and tribe had settled. All of this circling us back to the state of the world into which Nader was born in Khorasan in 1688. And despite all the aforementioned forces mixing together, lending to the chaos that was taking hold of Persia, Nader's early life was rather quiet and unremarkable. From a very early age as a young boy, helping his family to drive their small herd of sheep from Dargaz up the mountainside to Kapkan, back and forth in the yearly migration, while receiving a rustic or tribal-flavored Shia-based religious education, though certainly nothing formalized. And while Nader's parents would later on have another son, Nader's younger brother named Ibrahim Kuli, Nader's father apparently doted on his eldest son, teaching him horsemanship and a number of the martial skills required for shepherding, thus protecting their livelihood. Skills that were also associated with the prowess of the Kizilbash, since, as mentioned earlier, the Afshar had been one of the many tribes with an underlying military tradition, supplying the Safavids with cavalry. And by his tenth year, Nader was reportedly an able horseman, practiced in archery and javelin throwing for hunting as well. Overall though, probably quite the difficult existence, with his family consistently riding the line of poverty. Which again, is nothing really remarkable for the time, but stands as a fascinating contrast to the princes of the Safavid realm, such as Sultan Hussein, who became the new Shah of Iran in 1694, when Nader would have been about six years old. Sultan Hussein being a ruler that, like his father before him, had little interest in doing any actual ruling, preferring to retreat to the splendors of the royal harem instead. In fact, picking up the nickname Yakshadir, meaning very well in the Turkmen language, coming from the typical response he would provide when asked to decide on proposals from royal administrators on matters of state, just to get it off his plate as soon as possible, and was apparently so focused on the expansion of his harem and gardens, that despite his empire crumbling all around him in the early 1700s, he began making deep cuts to the nation's military expenditures in order to fund these selfish pursuits of pleasure oblivious to the harsh realities of the outside world and the struggles of the people within his empire. Like those being faced by the 13-year-old Nader upon the death of his father in 1701, resulting in his fatherless family falling into a period of abject poverty, his mother struggling as a widow to provide for her two young sons, with a great deal of the burden being placed on Nader's shoulders, who was only able to help put food on the table by gathering sticks for firewood and selling them at the local market. Now, this would have been an exceedingly difficult point in Nader's life, one that would have also fundamentally shaped his personality, hardening the resolve of this youth while grappling for his and the survival of his family. And throughout his life, this bleak starting point acting as a source of fierce pride for Nader, who reveled in his self-made ascension to the throne. To such a degree that many years later in 1739, while returning to Iran in triumph following his conquest of Delhi, he led the royal army to his birthplace and made a speech to his generals about his early life of deprivation, reportedly stating, You now see to what height it has pleased the Almighty to exalt me. Emphasizing the notion that, Unlike those of the Safavid dynasty, although he didn't possess a lineage of hereditary divine right to rule, clearly God still favored him for the throne. Unfortunately, it's at this point that the details surrounding his early life get a little murky, 
with some historical accounts mentioning that another grave disaster befell Nader shortly after the death of his father. At the hands of Uzbek raiders who carried Nader and his mother off into captivity and were subsequently sold off in a slave market to work on the estate of an Uzbek tribal warlord for several years. Where Nader's mother then died, and with nothing tying him to remain there any longer, Nader then escaping into the night, returning back to Dargaz in his later teens. With another possibility put forward for these unknown years, has Nader turning to a life of crime, leading a small band of like-minded and poverty-stricken youth to engage in some banditry raiding and theft of their own, since being a shepherd and selling sticks at the market was simply not going to cut it in terms of digging oneself out of an impoverished existence. And really, while both sequences are quite plausible, although we'll probably never know the real answer, both also serve as a sobering example of the constant unpredictability and desperation that surrounded those alive at the time trying to scrape out a meager existence. Whereas, historical accounts diverge greatly as to what happened in those years, they all tend to point in the same direction of what would happen next in Nather's life, all marking this as a major turning point, and in fact, the official starting point of Nather's military career when he was around 16 years old, thus bringing us to the moment that we covered off at the top end of this episode with Nader enlisting in the service of Baba Ali Beg, the Safavid governor of the city of Dargaz in Khorasan, who probably, at the most, had an estimated count of three to 4,000 local militia under his charge, the vast majority of which would have been traditional Kizilbash cavalry, but interestingly, also possessing a contingent of musketmen in his command, which is where Nader was placed, trained as a Tufangchi meaning musketeer, which would have been the first time that he ever handled gunpowder weapons, most certainly making an immediate and defining impression on him, quickly understanding their destructive capabilities when deployed en masse and correctly in battle. Nader, training in this capacity as a soldier, but also at times saddled with a broader number of duties, including acting as the law enforcement arm of the governor, protecting trade caravans, and undertaking tasks like defending and retrieving goods or captives taken in border raids, and apparently distinguishing himself among his peers as an exceptional soldier, to such a degree that Ali Beg then began to take notice of the talented young man, promoting him to something akin to sergeant-at-arms for the musketeer contingent, which may have numbered somewhere in the realm of 500 troops. The young Nader, now in his very early 20s, proving himself to be an able leader, fashioning the musketeers under him into an exceptionally well-drilled and trained group, accepting nothing less than sharp discipline and complete obedience to his orders, which were key features of his military leadership style throughout his career. Also, keenly understanding that firearms would only be effective to stop opposing forces when fired in unison as a group. Accordingly, Nader relentlessly trained his troops to function as a singular unit, to compound their potency in battle, discharge and reload quickly, not distracted by the events unfolding around them, ready to unleash another deadly volley of lead. And it quickly became clear that the confidence that Ali Beg had in Nader was well placed, because although Nader would have been by this point involved in countless squabbles and skirmishes, Dealing with smaller scale raids and banditry throughout his early career, his bravery in battle and military skill was soon proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Sometime around 1714, when Dargaz was assailed by a seasoned Uzbek warlord known by his nickname the Fox, who descended upon the region at the head of a large force of some 8,000 warriors. With Nader demonstrating early signs of the tactical brilliance and leadership that would fuel his future rise to prominence. And although we have only limited details on the sequence of events surrounding the defense of Dargaz against these marauding invaders, the fleeting references that we do have paint a picture of Nader and his musketeers playing a headlining role 
culminating in an intense final encounter just outside of the city, where Nather, although heavily outnumbered, stationed himself along with his 500 musketeers in the thick of battle as the prime target of the Uzbek cavalrymen. The most likeliest of setups which would have included positioning his firearm-bearing troops behind some type of obstruction, possibly wooden carts, but even more likely would have been using the natural physical barriers of the landscape, forming up his men on a valley mountainside. Either way, acting as the central bait, a seemingly attractive target to be overrun by the bulk of the fox's cavalry, who, unlike Nader and his men, would have been using the more traditional, muscle-powered weaponry of the time, bows, spears, lances, and swords, and failing to anticipate the danger and ruin that was about to befall them, since they would have been simply not used to infantry being deployed in such a manner, in the hands of such a capable commander. And despite the raiders bearing down on his position, Nader managed to hold his exceptionally trained musket men firm to steadily cut away at the fox's repeated cavalry charges, eviscerating their ranks, inhales of gunfire and smoke being emitted by the muskets, with Nader's loud and distinctive voice cutting through the clutter, ordering his troops to make ready for another wave. But soon, dismantling both the Uzbek's ability and morale to attack, with Ali Beg's mounted Kizilbash then entering the fray to sweep up and finish the job, routing what remained of the fox's disorganized and broken army, hundreds of which lay wounded and slain on the battlefield, with a reported 1,400 raiders also taken prisoner. This encounter apparently being one of such significance that in the days that followed, Ali Beg then sent the hero of Dargaz's recent defense off to the Safavid capital city of Isfahan, 1,200 kilometers away to the southwest, to be the bearer of this good news and report the victory to Shah Sultan Hussein, who rewarded Nader with the gift of 100 tumens, an enormous sum for someone like Nader, and probably more money than he had ever seen in his life. However, as impressed as the young Nader would have been with this, and his first time experiencing the capital, widely regarded as one of the largest and most beautiful cities of the time, I'm convinced that his opinion of the reigning Shah would have been far less so, shocked in what he had found, viewing Sultan Hussein, otherwise known as Yakshadir, as a soft, disconnected monarch, clearly only having risen to kingship due to his lineage. Striking a deep chord within Nader, leaving a bad taste in his mouth, and I imagine angrily reflecting on this often, while traveling the long distance back to Dargaz, struggling with the idea of this king, who wouldn't have lasted five minutes in Nader's unforgiving part of the world. How could such a man be suitable for kingship? Though it must be said, however fundamental this realization was for Nader at this point, we can never really do more than guess at, the more likely description being little more than irritated musings for now. With Nather then returning back to Ali Beg, who was becoming much more than his benefactor, the governor of Dargaz growing fonder and fonder of his rising star, and increasingly taking on a paternal role with Nather. And while some historians mention that an adversarial relationship developed between the two, stating that Nather murdered an associate in Baba Ali Beg's service during an assignment, in a flash of violence arising out of a misunderstanding, but in reality, in order to eliminate potential rivals for higher posts, thus angering the governor? While this instance cannot be outright disproven, I tend to doubt the authenticity of this, as this may have been a later invention to reinforce the nature of Nather's ruthless ways and ready-fire temper. But more so, because not only did Nather later continue his rise to become the governor's right-hand man, something like the captain of his militia, but also because Ali Beg married off his eldest daughter to Nather sometime in his early 20s, becoming his father-in-law. And after her death from natural causes a few short years later, this was followed by then marrying off a second daughter to Nather at around this time, 
a union that would produce the first two of Nader's four sons. This entire period of his life, from roughly 1704 to 1716, despite being filled with challenges, being one of great fortune for Nader, crystallizing the idea that his military acumen and obvious skill in this profession were central to his advancement in life, raising his station, wealth, and overall importance as an individual. This, along with the austere conditions of his early life, adding together to solidify his long-term view and understanding that military force was the only path by which he was going to control his destiny. Also, the time during which the now 28-year-old Nader was beginning to resemble the physically imposing description that I had mentioned earlier. Tall with a powerful frame, heavily bearded, and a loud resonating voice that commanded attention. Not to mention this being a time during which Nader gained tons of combat and leadership experience, convinced of the benefits of firearms, albeit in smaller scale engagements, but realizing that if scaled upwards, their devastating impacts could be exponentially multiplied. At this point in 1716, things were indeed looking up for Nader. However, this was not to be the case for too much longer, as his world was once again about to be turned upside down, thanks to an internal rebellion that had initially kicked off 1,200 kilometers away to the southeast of Dargaz in Kandahar, then also part of the Iranian Empire. And although a considerable distance away, would soon begin building momentum, threatening to spill over into Khorasan as well not only spelling the beginning of the end for the Safavid dynasty, but that would also leave Nader as a rogue warlord within his homeland of Khorasan, yet again reduced to struggling for his very survival. In the next episode, we'll learn more about this Afghan-based rebellion that explodes into a larger military movement quickly getting out of control, largely due to the bumbling Safavid military response, and that ends with the casting down of Shah Sultan Hussein from power, and much of the Iranian empire in the hands of the Hotak dynasty by 1722. This, as foreign nations, such as the Ottomans and Russians, look at this dire moment of weakness as their opportunity to enter the equation absorbing numerous Iranian territories into their respective domains. While in Khorasan, having been embroiled into the widening rebellion for some time, the chaotic atmosphere is soon amplified when Nader's benefactor Ali Beg is killed in battle, resulting in Nader gaining a new master, operating under the new Safavid governor of Khorasan, Malik Mahmud Sistani the opportunistic Safavid governor then changing sides, throwing his support behind the Hotak usurpers instead, resulting in Nader breaking with Sistani and effectively becoming an independent warlord within Khorasan, but then later putting his support behind Sultan Hussein's son, Tamas II, who is fighting to regain the Iranian throne. Nader again distinguishing himself in his service to rise to the lofty role as general of the Safavid army, during which he presides over a series of spectacular battlefield victories to restore the Safavids to power in 1729. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show, Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure, and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions for improvement. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from Audionautics.com